So after his conversation with um, Faber, he returns, Montag returns home to his wife and we get into sort of this um, new theme of the effect that um, his culture, his society has on a variety of different relationships. And it comes out when he first begins to explore in one of the books and he reads the quote, we cannot tell the precise moment when friendship is formed, as in filling a vessel drop by drop, there's at last a drop which makes it run over. So in a series of kindnesses, there's at last one which makes the heart run over. So I don't want you just to hear like blah, 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 because that's what his wife heard when he heard it to her. Let's take a moment and analyze this passage. What is it saying? It's saying, what is friendship? What is a relationship? It's like this vessel you have, like a cup, and you fill it one drop at a time, the first encounter with that person. It's not like, oh, this is a lifelong friendship. It's just kind of like, oh, that was a nice person. And then there's another drop, and another drop, and another drop of all of these encounters day after day. Maybe it's someone you sat next to in school. Maybe it's um, somebody that you saw regularly, like, I don't know, in um, like at a sports organization or something. And he says, you can't tell like that. When is that moment, that very moment that transfers something from being like just a general acquaintance to a sincere friendship? And he says, there is at some point a drop and it makes it run over. And what was it? It was a series of kindnesses. But there was that one, like when was that one that made it run over into something else? Or, I mean, I mean, it's talking about friendship, but he also turns and use, applies this to his wife. And he says, like, when did we meet? What's our story? Your story is important because it's what took us from acquaintances to like to love. What made it go from, hey, we're dating to I want to spend the rest of my life with this person? What was that moment? And in sort of the romantic sense, like, that is something to live for. That's something that books preserve. That's something to treasure, something special. Instead, this is what we have. Clarice was the first person I can remember who looked straight at me as if I counted. Clarice is not his wife, nor was she a love interest. She's just a person that he met, but he notes this stranger on a street was the first person who looked straight at me as if I counted. Who's the first person that looked straight at you as if you counted besides your parents? Now about his wife, Millie does, he licked his lips. Does your family, the TV, love you? Love you very much? Love you with all their heart and their soul? And it continues, he says, nobody listens anymore. I can't talk to the walls because they're yelling at me. I can't talk to my wife. She listens to the walls. I just want someone to hear what I have to say. And maybe if I talk long enough, it'll make sense. He wants someone to listen to him, someone to know him. He says to the other women who come over, so um, it's still in this chapter, his Millie's friends come over, and he says, I notice your husbands aren't here tonight. Oh, they come and go, come and go, said Mrs. Phelps. The three women fidgeted, and they looked nervously at the empty, mud-colored walls. Anyway, Pete and I always said, no tears, nothing like that. It's our third marriage each, and we're independent. Be independent, we always said. He said, if I get killed off, you just go right ahead and don't cry, but get married again, and don't think of me. So, I wouldn't say that's too unusual from what people think today about marriage in a lot of respects. Why? Why do it? Why be committed? It's not going to last. doesn't matter. Don't get sentimental about this. If a person breaks up with you, like, move on. Don't cry about it. It treats people as if they are objects rather than looking straight at them as if they count for something. How many of you want to have that moment, that last drop of kindness or that, that thing that transfers something from just the relationship you have with every other person in the world to something that stands apart, to something that matters and lasts forever. And that's what he hopes for, but this is what he gets. This is sort of the image that I found to depict 
guy looking off, wanting something more, and his wife, who's completely enamored with her quote-unquote family. And, of course, the rest of her um, friends who care nothing about their marriage. So I have this word down here, fubbing. I actually learned about it as I was doing research for this. Um, there is a peer-reviewed article. Let me see if I can find where I downloaded it. Um, pause. I'll be right back. Okay, found it. So it's a peer-reviewed article that was published by um, some professors in the Baylor School of Business in the journal called Computers and Human Behavior. And they basically coined this term. So I don't know if you're familiar. I don't think you probably have heard this term. But there is a term, a uh, portmanteau, which means where you form a word that derives from the blend of two other words. So fubbing is a portmanteau of the words phone and snubbing. To be fubbed is to be snubbed by someone using their cell phone when in your company. The fub could be an interruption of your conversation with someone when he or she attends to their cell phone or when you're in close proximity to another but they use their cell phone instead of communicating with you. And then you add a P to the front partner fubbing is when the above takes place when in the company of your spouse or a significant other. The ubiqui ubiquitous nature of cell phones makes fubbing in general or more specifically a near inevitable occurrence. In fact, 70% of a sample, it was a smallish sample size, but 143 females involved in romantic relationships reported that cell phones sometimes, often, or very often and all the time interfere with their interactions with their partners. Other studies have found fubbing to be a common occurrence among romantic partners as well. The present research investigates whether fubbing impacts relational satisfaction and individual well-being etc etc so this is going to be a study um that they conducted and um i wanted to just show you a couple of the basically outtakes um regarding relationship satisfaction so obviously um the results above suggest through evidence that a partner's use of a cell phone while in the company of his or her romantic partner may have a negative effect on relationship satisfaction. And so here's the following hypothesis that they provide. As fubbing increases, reported levels of relationship satisfaction will de decrease. And so um, they talk about cell phone conflict in relationships, um, the moderating role of attachment anxiety, um, so their third hypothesis is that the relationship between fubbing and cell phone con conflict will be moderated by attachment anxiety. So if you have somebody who's highly um, anxious, with, like for no through no fault of their own, really, maybe they came from an unstable home environment growing up, maybe they had a parent that left them. A lot of people today um, test as sort of anxious, attach, have an anxious attachment style, meaning when you get into a relationship, you're anxious about it all the time, but it might fall apart, the person might leave you, and with cell phones, it makes that, it aggravates that, it makes it even worse. Um, they also conclude that um, fubbing will have an indirect negative impact on an individual's own well-being, specifically the lower levels of relationship satisfaction resulting from conflict surrounding fubbing will be associated with lower levels of life satisfaction in general. So they will, it will be associated with more depressive symptoms. And so the results of two studies are going to be shown here. But in other words, it doesn't just affect the person in his or her marriage relationship, but in life in general, there's sort of this sense of depression and dissatisfaction and not being known. So similar to our book, right? And so um, they go over their methods of study, and here's their conclusion. The institution of marriage is under attack. Approximately 40 to 50% of all marriages will end in divorce, while many of the intact unions are poorly functioning and characterized by low levels of relationship satisfaction. So 50% end in divorce, a majority of the other ones are miserable. As intimated in the title of this paper, it appears that life has become a major distraction from our cell phones. It's ironic that cell phones originally designed as a communication tool hinder rather than foster satisfying relationships, and the results suggest that partner fubbing creates conflict over the use of one's cell phone, which impacts reported relationship satisfaction. 
Attachment anxiety is found among individuals who experience fubbing with anxious attachment styles. Um, the negative effects grow stronger over time, and it finds that relationship satisfaction has a positive impact on life satisfaction, whereas poor satisfaction has a generally depressing um, effect overall. Given that the marital relationship satisfaction is a cornerstone for family well-being, research investigates how technology use impacts our relationships and that it is critical. So Guy is not too far off from what we experience today. Let's move on to another type of relationship that's impacted. It's called distracted parenting. Um, I'll pull up this article in a moment, actually. Let's just kind of look at what the book says about it. So Guy asks the women, how are your children, Mrs. Phelps? You know I haven't any. No one in his right man, mind, the good Lord, knows would have children, said Mrs. Phelps, not quite sure why she was angry with this man. I wouldn't say that, said Mrs. Bowles. I've had two children by cesarean section. No use going through all that agony for a baby. The world must reproduce, you know. The race must go on. Besides, they sometimes look like you, and that's nice. So again, all about you. Children are ruinous. You're out of your mind, said Mrs. Phelps. Well, I plunk the children in school nine days out of ten. I put up with them when they come home three days a month. It's not bad at all. You have them in the parlor and you turn on the switch. It's like washing clothes, stuff laundry in, and slam the lid. So I hope I don't have to point out how disturbing this is, um, that children are basically deposited and plunked in front of a television for their inconvenient fact, for their inconvenience. Um, but The Atlantic recently, in 2018, so not quite a year ago, um, no, okay, almost two years ago, but still, um, did a piece on the dangers of distracted um, parenting, not talking about children's use of screen time, but parental use of screen time. Child development experts have different names for this kind of signaling system between an adult and a child. Um, a pediatrician says that the developing child calls it the serve and return style of communication. Um, they describe sort of a conversational duet. The vocal patterns parents everywhere tend to adopt during exchanges with infants and toddlers are marked by a high-pitched tone, simplified grammar, and engaged, exaggerated enthusiasm. This is so exciting. I'm so happy for you, that sort of thing. Though this talk is cloying to adult observers, babies can't get enough of it. Not only that, one study showed infants exposed to this type of interactive, emotionally responsive speech at 11 months and 14 months know twice as many words at age two as those who aren't exposed to it at all. Um, so child development is relational. It, their growth and understanding of language, of how the world works, of their attachment, um, social emotional learning all comes from direct contact um, and engagement between a parent and a child. Therefore, a problem arises when an adult child queuing system is interrupted by a text, for example, or a quick check on Instagram. Anyone who has been mowed down by a smartphone-impaired stroller operator can attest to the ubiquity of this phenomenon. There are many consequences. Um, parents are, I mean, I could go on and on and on, but the book doesn't um, go into it, so we're not going to, but it is a really interesting read just on like the severity of the consequence of this. So um, what's to be done? It brings up this concept of censorship versus self-discipline. Censorship, it simply looks around for objectionable matter that is sensitive or harmful. It looks at morals, conduct, acceptable notions, ethics. Do we need something like the government to put a censorship on our media con consumption? Or do we, as individuals, have enough reason and self-discipline to be able to say, this is not good. We should not do this. And... In the end, Faber says, you're romantic. So I want you to look at these images. Take them in. Image, really, um, relationship images, family. It would be funny if it were not so serious. It's not something we can take lightly. What do you aspire to? This is what Guy longed for in a world very similar to ours. And this is what he saw. This is what he was engaged in. And what are we going to do about it?